Uh, welcome all uh, to a session of Clear Eyes classes. Uh, today we have a master class with Professor Pushpesh Pan uh, on Indian art, heritage, and culture. I'm really happy and proud to host such a renowned guest on the Clear Eyes classes platform. Uh, hope you know more uh, about Professor Pushpesh Pan. Pushpesh Pan is a renowned educator, author, and Padma Sri awardee, and he will be taking a master class on Indian art, heritage, and culture. Uh, to give an, uh, a quick intro about uh, 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 Professor Pan, uh, Professor Pan has a postgraduate degree uh, in Indian history, international relations, and law. He has taught at the Delhi and Jawaharlal Nehru universities and published over 20 books focusing on the cultural heritage of India, covering subjects like the Himalaya, Lower Ganga, Buddhism, Ajanta and Ellora, Madhya Pradesh, and Sikkim, Indian cuisines, and the Grand Trunk Road. He has been associated as a researcher, scriptwriter, and anchor with over 200 documentaries telecast nationally, including the acclaimed series on Ports of India, Rivers of India, and the Soul of India. He has been a regular columnist in, in, in reading English and Hindi newspapers, chronicling culture over four decades. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Professor Pan, uh, to the uh, master class session uh, with respect to uh, Clear Eyes classes. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Alex. And I think we can begin right away. Uh, very uh, grateful to you for your generous uh, words of introduction. But before we begin the class with uh, the students in the class which has joined us, I would like to share with you a small story of this book, how this book came about. And, you know, all my life I have either been teaching translations, law or researching food. But when my publisher, uh, Mr. Shobhit Arya, came up with the proposal of uh, could I be associated with a book on Indian art, literature and culture, I jumped at it. Because I, then I suddenly realized that what has been happening is that professionally I might be doing one thing or the other. But what has been always with me is what we call culture. Now, the Trouble is that when you prepare for a competitive examination and you are supposed to uh, prepare according to a syllabus, you are so burdened with the idea of culture that you think you don't want to make a differentiation between culture and civilization. And you forget that the most important thing about culture is that culture is our identity. So when you say I'm an Indian, I locate myself in an Indian civilizational stream temporarily, and I also belong to a tradition which is Indian. It may be Hindu, it may be Muslim, it may be Buddhist, it may be Christian, it may be uh, Parsi, whatever, or Sikh for that matter, Buddhist or Jain. So I think what when we talk in terms of culture, we tend to forget um, that culture is an integral part of our life, and that's the best way to approach it. If you locate yourself where you are and like the great uh, Upanishadic dictum is there, know thyself, Atmanam Vidhi. Uh, so when you try to look inward and see who you are and where you are placed, culture becomes very, very easy to comprehend, understand it is no longer a question of cramming. You suddenly realize that it is like a tree with branches, their roots are deep down spreading in different directions, branches are spreading out, and like a banyan tree, the branches convert themselves into root. Or you could think in terms of culture as a river system where there is a mainstream, there are tributaries, there are contributaries, there are estuaries, there are confluences, and then the composite thing becomes the culture. So I think when this idea came, uh, this is the origin of the idea of this book, uh, Top Now by Wisdom Tree, uh, uh, Introduction to Indian Art, Heritage and Culture. Now, what I would like to emphasize is that when we do this master class, the thought that would be inspiring me and encouraging me to share my ideas with you would be this concept that culture is not something complex. Culture is not something very uh, abstract. Culture is not something to be crammed about. Culture is all of us are. We are, after all, cultured human beings. So the differentiation between agriculture and culture is not as acute as people think. So I would like to begin uh, and give you a few examples. So may I uh, request Alex to please share the screen of the a PPT, so we can begin with certain images, and I can perhaps take you on a guided tour that, like the book has several sections. It is a section on built heritage, it is a section on performing arts, it is a section on visual arts, it is a section on religion, language, scripts, ideas, dances, theater, music, etc., science, technology, folk art and forms, handicrafts, 
all of which seems to be very burdensome and very large uh, area to cover for examinations. So you have to probably appreciate this fundamental point, first of all, that you can begin anywhere and then the interrelationships take you to other areas and where you do. And I must also at this stage, it might appear like a shameless plug, but I think the book was designed beautifully by Wisdom Tree, where the illustrations supplement the text and when you hear what you see in the PPT is not the text which is available in the book, but when you flick the pages of this book, you would realize that the text supplements the images and the images are visual communication on their own. So let's begin. The beginning is that for most of us in India and abroad, the Indus Valley civilization is where we begin. Uh, and the Indus Valley civilization is where the story begins, where the excavations have brought to light a vast expanse of land, which was covered by beautifully planned cities and certain material has come out. There, as you can see, that certain terracotta statues are there. The most famous one is this gentleman in a three petal flower decorated shawl. And he is maybe a high priest, maybe whatever he is. Uh, we'll come to discuss this a little later. And I would also like to share with you another thought. When you prepare for culture, especially for uh, competitive examinations, you are not preparing only for culture, quote unquote, as a special um, aspect of the syllabus. You are also revising your history syllabus. You are also revising bits of sociology, bits of social structure in India and is there. So this gentleman is wearing a shawl. It is a statue of a person who may be a priest, who may be a high ranking official. The script of Indus Valley Civilization has not been deciphered. But what does this image tell you? This image tells you that the people who stayed in Indus Valley civilization had mastered the art of weaving cloths and also decorating them with a design. You have this gentleman with a very nicely trimmed uh, beard. So he was not using a modern trimmer battery operated one, but there were instruments, metallic razors, which you could safely use to do this. Now you see there is next to it is another terracotta image, which is the mother goddess derived from there. Now, the moment you have this image, you again, not only think in terms of what is there, um, you also think in terms of religious beliefs of these people. So did they believe in fertility rights? Did they believe in mother goddess? And if you have, could we just uh, go to the next slide, please? If we could go to the next slide, uh, you see, we come to something which is very far removed from uh, the Indus Valley civilization. We suddenly have a look at the Jagannath temple. And the Jagannath temple is one of the seven sacred cities in India commemorated in Sanskrit literature. It also is famous for its champan bhog. So then we come to, when we come to a section on intangible heritage of Indian culture and talk in terms of food, then we start worrying about vegetarianism, non-vegetarianism, what people ate, who were the rice eaters, who were the wheat eaters, uh, uh, and what were the sweeteners, what were the cooking medium, etc., etc. And But more to the point, right now let's concentrate on the built up heritage, because we started with the ruins of a built up heritage in Indus Valley civilization. Nothing remains intact. Mohanjadoro means amount of the dead, and you have got some large tanks, you have granaries, but we shall leave that for the time being. Then you come here to a temple, which is a distinct style called the Nagar style of te temple. It also is dedicated to a god who is a Vaishnav uh, incarnation of Vishnu. And this is one of the four major dhams, places of pilgrimage for India. So what does this image tell you? This image tells you that in thousands of years, uh, construction moved from rock cut caves, natural caves, grottos, to rock cut caves, to masonry, from wood to stone transition. and towering structures like this, which were places of worship. So there were sent cities who were temple cities, temple grammars, agraharams, we'll come to that later. But right now, you have to uh, not worry about that. You have to worry not about that. Right now, just remember the four dhams, who, who established the four dhams? It was the Adi Guru, Jagat Guru Shankaracharya, in the 7th century, who said that the four farmers of India should be consecrated so an emotional unity could bind together the people of India. But interestingly, the Jagannath temple is one of the, one of the temples there. So it allows you to re refresh your memory about the food and uh, ritual foods in India. It, it talks about Vaishnava pilgrimages. So 
we are no longer talking of a mother goddess or the palace worship from the Indus Valley civilization. We are talking of very well developed, complex system of beliefs. And also, this is um, temple is related to the legend of Sri Krishna, uh, rich in the lore of Odissi dance and Jayadev's poetry. Now, forget about the structure which is looking out at you, beautiful structure, massive structure, but it also tells you that the temples were integrally related with performing arts. So if there is a classical dance form like Odissi, uh, the postures, the asans, the mudras, the gestures are inscribed with the sculptures in the wall of this temple. You also have the poetry which is sung with the Odissi dance, um, so when you have the so when you have uh, uh, the dance forms or the poetry you have the poetry of Jayadev, the Ashtapadi the, the Shavatar and then you also have the worship of Nemai Thakur Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who came and is believed to have merged himself into the Lord here. Now interesting the point is that the moment you come to this temple, all these associations radiate like from a spokes, from a wheels, great wheels spokes. So we are looking at one temple building, but it is also uh, igniting our mind to borrow Professor Kalam's phrase up to think about classical dance forms, dance forms, food, ritual or otherwise. And also the icons which are put in this temple are interesting. They are not Radha Krishna, which is normally you encounter in most temples. You have Balbhadra, uh, Balram, Subhadra and Shri Krishna, or the, the two brothers and a sister. And these are carved out, not of metal or stone, but of, but of wood. So people have also speculated, the scholars, that this built up on a cult of Jagannath, uh, which originated as a tribal form of belief. And then even till present day, you reinstall these idols after 12 years, looking for sacred wood and so on. <clears throat> Again, the legend and lore of how the images reached here is, the idea propagated is among the devout is that when Dwarka, the capital of Krishna on the west coast was submerged, was taken over by the sea, the, in a small casket, these images came up to this place and the king then here in the Dhimna had a dream and made this temple. Now, this is all this folklore, all this music, all this poetry links this temple with the other part of India, the other dham in Somnath. It links you with Brindavan and Ras and stories of Krishna. So this one bit of architecture also makes you think of other things. So that is what I would like you to keep in mind, that try to see, try to solve like a jigsaw puzzle, which is very pleasant, the enigma which the Indian culture, the diversity of Indian culture places for you. Could we go to the next slide, please? Now you see, this is another temple from Uritsa. Now this is a Lingaraj temple. Now the Lingaraj temple is dedicated to Shiva. So which again makes you think you, you can look at the architecture. It's the same style of architecture. There is a shikar, there is a bhog mandap, there is a nut mandap, and what their functions were are there. They have similarities of architectural styles, slightly tapering uh, shikar, amlaki on top, etc. But don't worry about those details. What this temple, Lingaraj temple, tells you is dedicated to Shiva. It means that Shaivite uh, sect of Hinduism and the Vaishnavite sect of Hinduism coexisted harmoniously here. So right now in striped on times, when we have worried about different creeds, different communities, this bit tells us, even the architectural thing, that one temple is Shiva, the other temple is Vishnu, and the minor deities are all wrong. Let's have the next slide. The next slide is even more interesting, I think. This is the famous Konarka Sun Temple called the Black Pagoda. Only a very small part survives. The towering structure has gone long time back. Uh, the vagaries of time and sea uh, climate has uh, seeped through, eroded the stone. But interestingly, you can see in this there are wheels. And this is supposed to be a metaphorical representation of sun's passage through the sky. So there are seven horses, which represent seven days of a week. There are 24 wheels and there are different spokes in that. So it's, it is they represent days in a week, fort, fortnights, month, months, and the spokes on these wheels serve also as a sundial. Now, here we can, most people talk in terms of Konark, in terms of erotic architecture, which is there, which you will read about it when you dip a little in the book, uh, what they represent, what the symbolization is. But interestingly, here it is the science and technology which is going, which shows that when the temple of Konark was built, 
close to eight to nine hundred years ago, the the people who made it had a very precise understanding of how to measure time with a sun sundial or a clock. So sun fell at different times in different directions of this temple, and you could very accurately tell the time. It is something like a jantar mantar sundial in Delhi, and it tells you about how precise their calculations were about seasonal movement of sun across the sky. The all the folklore also has that the, the uh, metallic icon of uh, idol of Surya was suspended through very powerful magnets in the sanctum sanctorum of this temple, and the Portuguese, who were the earliest to encounter this, the seafarers, have also referred to that how the powerful magnet interfered with their compass and their navigation. Some stories might be true, some stories might not be true. But what is edged in stone is quite there for you to see that how, besides the master of archi mastery of architecture, which even the artisans had to have they had a very interesting relationship between measurement of time, movement of celestial bodies or in the sky. Maybe go to the next slide, please. Now, you see, this is another interesting feature about the temple architecture. Now, what I'm trying to do is not trying to promote a particular creed of Hinduism or a particular religion uh, through this cultural book, but I'm saying that when you encounter a Shiva temple in Bajanath in Himachal Pradesh, made in the same style, Nagar style of Orissa, you are made to sit up and think, how did these hundreds of years reach here? Could there could not have been a mass exodus of artisans from Orissa to Him Himachal Pradesh? Maybe you have the next slide, which is even more curious. Uh, this is the Jageshwar temple in Uttarakhand, in the midst of a Devdar Sidar forest. And this again, as you can see, is the Nagar style of temple architecture with many, many shrines surrounding it. You have the temple of Badrinath, you have the temple of Kedarnath, you have the temple of Rudranath, and you have the temple of Madhmaheshwar. All these temples are replicas, resemblances, mirror images of what you encounter in Odisha. So which shows that there was there were roots of cultural transmission, and it was not only techniques of architecture. The same people who built these shrines dedicated to Shiva or Vishnu were also carrying with them ideas about religious beliefs, technology, mastery of a craft, also stories and folklore. So the country was woven into one whole emotionally, not only through religion, because it, the, it was not only the Brahman priests who were doing it. It was also the so-called outcast craft people who build these massive structures who would transmit their skills to other parts of the country. Uh, maybe have the next slide, please. Now, you see, this book is really, what fascinates me about this book is, and I must, I'm very, very grateful to my publisher. He employed artists and layout designers to make everything very, very simple. It was not spoon feeding for the students. So like uh, after we have aroused your interest in the subject, we come to a pictogram or infographic like this. So this is a temple, Kandarya Mahadev uh, in central India, uh, three, uh, maybe uh, around the same time, but very different time uh, chronology from the early temples in Mahabalipuram in the fourth, fifth century, uh, or rock cut temples during the Rajputra times in Elora. But you can see that this is different. It is. It looks a bit like the Nagar Shaili of Orissa, but it's very different. The shikhar is curvy linear. Uh, the galleries which you see here are very different, which you don't encounter there. And you have small pointers, labels. So if you have a look at it, you don't have to read 500 words to understand a specialized jargon, etc. Maybe you look at the picture twice, you look at this infographic once, you go back to the text and you follow your interest. So maybe one day you read about erotic architecture in Khajuraho, which is what draws tourists there. You try to compare it with erotic architecture in uh, Kunark, but then you try to compare the Das postures in Lingaraj temple with the Puri temple, and you say that how these temple walls tell you so much about the everyday life of the people. They also depict the celestial play of the gods and goddesses on the friezes. But this is what I think is the great thing about this book. Kindly uh, move on to the next slide, please. Now, this again is another temple which is the temple of the southern style, is the Brihadishwara temple at Tanjore. You see, look at this. This temple is even, although it is a South Indian temple, it doesn't confirm to the general stereotype of the South Indian temples. We shall see them a little later, where there's the 
decorated ornate arch gateway, the Gopuram, is something which towers over the Shikara. But here, the Gopuram is recedes into the background and you have a Shikara. Even in the small picture, what you can see uh, is very interesting. There is a massive monolithic round stone on top. So just forget about the temple, forget about its architectural differences from other temples. Try to ask yourself, how did this piece of stone tons heavy reach in, in this place? Obviously, the people who built the temple had mastered, had mastered the architecture. So you, you see, uh, when you see this, you try to imagine how could they calculate exactly how heavy a weight this tower could bear and could and, and could probably imagine what we are told there was a ramp built which was four miles long on one side, four miles long on the other side, and elephants dragged the stone on top. It was precisely placed not to uh, crush the structure, and then the elephants took it on the other side. So here again, we are talking not only of temple architecture. We are not talking of only architecture. We are talking of other ancillary technological uh, marvels which this must have entailed. Uh, could we move over to the next slide, please? Now, this you see is a decorated gopuram which we are talking about. This is a typical South Indian temple architectural feature. The main shikar is not seen. The main viman and the mandap is not seen. But this multi-storied um, gopuram or the uh, arch gateway is there you know, on all four cardinal directions. Next to it is a humpy temple, which again, you see neither the massive towering gopuram is there, nor um, the shikar of the North Indian style is there, nor the rather kind of a structure of Mahamalipuram is seen. But you can see the diversity even within the southern architecture among the temple architecture. Now, once we do this, we appreciate one major feature about Indian culture, that there is a diversity glorious diversity, which has interacted, there is synthesis, there is imbibing of different influences, and there is evolution over a period of time of a particular style of either architecture or evolution of ideas or technology. So let's move on to the next slide. For the purposes of this um, masterclass, I have confined myself to mostly to the built up heritage section for two reasons, because I think you can see a variety of images about buildings which are places of palaces, ports, monuments, mausoleums, public spaces. And here again, we have the same thing when we talk about this. Here, there we have the mosques. And we have the mosques like the most famous So we have this most famous Jama Masjid in Delhi, but next to it is another Masjid in Delhi, which is the Kila Kuna Masjid within the compound of the Purana Kila. And you can see the mosque on the right was built by Shir Shah. The mosque on the left obviously was commissioned by Shah Jahan when he built the new city of Delhi. And you can see the two, this one has minarets and domes. This one doesn't have minarets, but it has a dome. So the characteristic features of a mosque a uh, minarets, dome, a uh, pillared corridor, arches are there. So all you do is you remember three things. You don't have to mug them up. They, they, you look for a minar, you look for a minaret, you look for a dome, you look for an arch doorway, you look for a pillared uh, corridor, and you suddenly realize what the major features of a mosque architecture are. Then let's have the next slide, please. These are not the only, only things. You know, these slides, uh, again, I tell you is this, that there is Tajul Masajid in Bhopal. Now, this is a mosque which is built in 19th century by the enlightened Begums of Bhopal. So it's unique in two, two ways that there was a public role given to the Begum, assumed by the Begums of Bhopal, and they also uh, were generous patrons of architecture. And this is a beautiful mosque. This small, small picture doesn't quite do justice to this. The vast open expense there is. But have a look at the next mosque. It is a Hadrathbal mosque in Kashmir, in the valley of Kashmir in Srinagar. So you can again see there is a minaret, there is a dome. In Tajul Masajid, there are minarets and there are domes, but two are very, very different. But the places of worship is not only of the Sunni Muslims. So when you dwell deep in this culture book, you will also notice that there are two major sects in Islam. There is Sunni and Shias. And of course, there, is, there, are, there are the Sufis. But then again, the Shia place of worship is a Imam Bada. 
And this you see downstairs is the Bada Imam Bada in Lucknow, um, which has been encountered in various films like Shatranj Ke Khiladi when Wadi Nisha was exiled from Lucknow by the, by the British. But you see that there again, there is no minarets here, there are no domes here, and the architecture is very, very different. And next slide, please. Now, these are uh, these are mausoleums and monuments. Now, again, you see, these are not places of worship. These are not mosques. These are mausoleums dedicated to uh, Emperor Humayun on top and uh, commemorating Mumtaz Mahal, the beloved wife of Shah Jahan. You again see minarets. You again see domes. You again see arts. But again, you must remember, you have pillared courtyards uh, below the platform. But this is not a place of, place of worship. So which means that it would be very, very naive and short-sighted for, for a person to cut down, to divide buildings as uh, mosques, temples, uh, uh, masjids. Uh, they influence each other. So you would have, we, we have plenty of examples inside. You have a Gurdwara which incorporates a feature architectural feature of a mosque and a temple at the same time. You have palaces which give you uh, a bit of uh, the Islamic influence, pre moral a post moral a bit of classical uh, European influence and also Hindu architecture, Rajput architecture. Next slide, please. This again is a very interesting mausoleum. It is in Victoria Memorial in Calcutta, built in the beginning of the 20th century. You can again see there are no minarets, but there is a dome, and there are features which resemble a European uh, palace, uh, maybe Versailles. But look at this. This would be nowhere in Europe. This would no. There is a again the material used is like Taj Mahal marble, and you have. Uh, it's almost like the Gandhar art when you talk in terms of Buddha images that they, they were probably being crafted by people uh, who knew the technique of uh, the Greeks but whose hearts and soul were Indian. Well, it, it's a, almost a cliched formulation. But what I'm trying to mm, encourage you to think is that you look at a picture and it's always said a picture is worth a thousand words. And that I think is the best feature of this book. Uh, there might be, uh, there might be more exhaustive books, more exhaustive treatments of Indian culture. But A, they would be very, very specialized. You would have two volume treatment of Hindu temple by Srila Kramarish. You might have books on music, one volume on Dhrupad, one volume on dance, one particular jar, but nothing would allow you to appreciate. So I think it has been an education for myself. When I started working on this book, it took me back to my childhood. It rekindled my memories about how I was introduced to a painting a style of song, whether I preferred a folk song or a classical song. Why did I prefer? I, I was forced to ask myself a question. Why do I prefer, uh, let's say, Bharatanatyam to Kathak or the other way around or Manipuri Ras to something which is Udiyattam, Mohiniyattam or Kathakali depiction of the same Krishna episode in Kathakali. So there are interesting things. Of obviously, when you are preparing for IAS or allied examinations, you will have to worry about uh, the eight classical styles, several folk styles. Unfortunately, what has become very confusing in the IAS examination is that because majority of the Indian states are linguistically reorganized, and after that, some states have been um, some states have been formed for political exigencies. What has happened is. What has happened is that each state wants to have an identity of its own and wants to uh, explore and find out, invent for itself uh, a local dance form, a local style of architecture, local language, script, etc., etc. So I would say that this, this book allows us to be, go beyond that and say zones of cultural influence within the subcontinent uh, first of all, before undivided India, then post-independence India. So something which is common to Bengal, to Orissa, bits of Bihar, adjacent areas of Assam, something like that in Tamil Nadu, in Kerala, in Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, which split now into Telangana. You have the Maharashtra, which has a large footprint. It at, at once incorporated Gujarat. So it is it becomes it becomes easier for you to appreciate that what was a common, what is the common shared heritage of the people staying in a geography. And that geography may share a language, may not share a language. It, it may have a multiplicity of religious beliefs, 
uh, folklores and traditions, mm-hmm. and they would be common to two, three states again. So we'll come to that when you delve deep, deeper in the book. Next slide, please. You now these are public buildings. Now these are public buildings of a special kind. Uh, these are step wells. Uh, people went there to draw water for drinking purposes. This is a dried up one. I'm saying Kibawli in Delhi, and this is Rani Kibaw near Ahmedabad in Gujarat. So you have, uh, you can see that this is showing you a structure uh, again, which are some use of arches are made. So obviously this is showing an Indo-Islamic sense. This is of architecture, but this is something which was not a rich man's palace. This is where the common people came to um, drink water, take water from your home, and maybe rest in the cool shade. But then again, the, the amount of engineering knowledge which has gone into this, slowly you get down various steps to draw water, and how do you take it back, back to the surface, and how are these common spaces provided that without encroaching on the privacy of people, maybe the women used to go down there to fetch water and maybe the men used to go and take a dive and swim. Uh, so this is something. These are the main categories. First of all, shelters from natural grottoes in rocks to rock cut shelters to caves like Ajanta. You have the magnificent structure of Elora Temple. Uh, and then you get down to forts palaces, places of worship, and public spaces. So if you keep these categories in mind, go over a timeline, it should not be a difficult for you. Maybe move over to the next, uh, next slide, please. Now, this is what I wanted to conclude with. Now, I wanted to conclude with this uh, small PowerPoint presentation with a random example. Not that this Ram temple is in fashion today and is a controversy, etc. This is a Ram Katha painting. Look at the painting. It is, it, is, it is something which is in the style which you might say Rajput miniatures, the Mughal miniatures, the Pahadi column, etc. It shows you Ram Lakshman. It shows you Hanuman. It shows you Sita. And it shows you the forest. Now, the title of this, this particular piece is Ram, Lakshman, Sita with Hanuman in a forest. Now, they were in a forest and you suddenly remember the, even if you have the familiarity of Amar Chitrakatha, that what is the Ram story? Ram, the prince of Ayodhya, was banished to mm, spend 14 years in exile by his father, who had promised his favorite wife that he would grant her two wishes. And when Ram was anointed the crown prince, Kekai wanted this to happen, that her son should be anointed the crown prince and Ram should be dispatched to the forest for 14 years. But this legend of Ram, the story of Ram, the Ramayan, is a very important part of India's cultural tradition. There are at least 2,000 versions of Ramayans extant in India and in Southeast Asia, including Laos, Cambodia, Indonesia, Thailand. Even if you end up in Bangkok, the main highways there are uh, named after Ram. The capital, ancient capital, was called Ayutthaya which is a takeoff on Ayutthaya. And you have a famous uh, puppet, um, shadow puppet plays, uh, the Vayang Kulit Indonesia, which reenact the story of Ramayan and also Mahabharat. But here we are focusing on Ramayan. So what happens is that the story of Ramayan also occurs in a very small seed form in Mahabharat. So which tells us chronologically that the events described in Ramayan, some real, some fetishized, must have occurred before the Battle of Kurukshetra was fought, which is described in Mahabharata. But more importantly, the version changes with rendering. So you have a Tamil version, which is the Kambam Ramayan. You have other Ramayans. You have Valmiki Ramayana in Sanskrit. You have the more famous in North India, Tulsi Das's Ram Charitmanas, based on the story of Valmiki Ramayana. Again, the Ramayana is stuff which is subject of devotional songs, bhajans, folk songs, classical dancing, theater, the battle between good and evil, the metaphorical ones. And you have the geography of Ramayana, which allows you to plot India as it was familiar to Indians then. Where was Ayodhya? Now, Ayodhya is something, Kosal is something, which is the kingdom of Kosal, which is mentioned in the 16 Mahajampats before the, before the um, foundation of the modern empire, modern empire. And then you have Lanka, which may not be Sri Lanka, which may be uh, 
some place located in Dandakaranya. What was Dandakaranya? The parallel forest where people were banished? Where was it exist? So you have the rivers mentioned, you have the flora and fauna described, you have the characters described, you have the aborigines who came to help, uh, the indigenous people helped to Ram. There was a demonical king uh, who was oppressing his people, the Ravan, but he was very rich and prosperous. So this, this information, which is at times symbolic, at times metaphorical, at times with a more than a kernel of history, allows you to appreciate different cultural mores outside what is called the Hindi heartland, which was where Ram started his journey from and ended his journey back again. You again have the medieval poets like um, Malik Muhammad Jayasi, who wrote Padmavat, who talks of Sri Lanka, who talks not of Ram's story, but brings in together different geographies in this. So you have the legends of Krishna, you have the legends of Ram, you have the two major epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata, and the two major um, stories therein, one is the descent of Ganga, the other is Samudra Mantha. So the churning of the sea and the descent of the river celestial from um, heavens to redeem the ancestors of Bhagirath to the present day. So now you can look at Bhagirath as a very, very prescient engineer who was thinking of taming the uh, tributaries of Ganga, turbulent tributaries, so they don't play havoc down, downstream. Or it could be somebody who's only saying that this river purifies you because when you consecrate land, you don't pollute the river or the life-giving stream. So this consecration of land, the land is very, it goes beyond Hinduism. It goes beyond, where, wherever you go to a temple, you go to a Gurdwara, you go to a mosque, you go to a church, you have this, this, this issue at all. So I would suggest that if you treat uh, the story of Indian art, heritage and culture, you would again see that you may have a film being made in uh, 21st century or 20th century, which harks back to this archetypal tale of good and evil, heroism, uh, villainy, loyalty and treachery, which we'll see there. So it is, it is one of these things which you must keep in mind. Now, there is a lot more in the book, which is in different sections, but you could do to different sections the same thing, which I said uh, which I tried to do with you this morning, that you start with built up heritage, it takes you to sculpture, it takes you to painting, it takes you to music, it takes you to performing art, it takes you to science and technology, it takes you to ideas about, uh, philosophical ideas about why we are born, why do we exist, why, why do we lie, and also there is this beautiful interplay, like a mosaic of different patterns being formed by different elements which have come to us from different, different times. It is not, they have only come to us. They have gone from India elsewhere also. So some we refer to, um, we refer to uh, culture as a soft power. And then we already have mentioned uh, Angkor Wat and we have mentioned um, Indonesia and Prambanan and Borobudur and Ramayan there and Laos and in Thailand. You have the declensions of uh, Buddhism uh, to, from Myanmar to Sri Lanka to Nepal to Thailand to Cambodia to all the way to Korea and Japan. But then all these things one by one at a time. I would go back to the original advice before you can quiz me about what your specific questions are that start anywhere and just follow your own interests. And don't treat this as a textbook which you have to mug for your examination. It will pay back many more times if you treat this as a companion, as an introduction to Indian culture, similarities and differences between what you see. I mean, I wish we could locate that, but it would have taken too much time. There's a beautiful wooden mosque in Kerala, which we could have shown you and say how it is totally different from a mosque somewhere else. I could have shared with you a design of a mosque which is being proposed to be built where the Babri Masjid once was very close to it, which is totally ultra-modern. And there has been some discussion about that. So how things evolve, how culture is not a fossilized tradition, but is a living, vibrant tradition, is something which this book tries to tell you. I will stop here and you can ask me questions. You can see clarifications and you can suggest things. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the wonderful session, sir. Uh, I would like to 
uh, say a few things uh, by uh, I mean first I would like to uh, say a few things about the book. Uh, the publisher Topner had uh, shared me a copy of the book. Uh, it's a beautiful book with uh, more than three uh, hundred specially curated photographs. I have never seen any book on culture. uh with color prints uh, I, i mean realistic color prints uh, which shows uh, uh, i mean which helps to learn culture in a top entirely different way uh, and i uh, i mean attending the uh, your class uh, I, i can see the passion and your experience and your interest in the subject and that is totally reflected in this book so i, I let me first start on behalf of my students that uh, uh, i mean uh, i mean i, I uh, one more thing uh, the the book not only helps to answer questions on indian culture but it is equally useful in different areas with respect to upsc civil services examination like uh, the essay paper or the upsc interview uh, there are a lot of things that can be taken from this book uh, which can be applied to the essay paper and the interview uh, and but my question is specifically with respect to the uh, indian culture which most aspirants find very difficult to learn uh so uh, uh you have elaborated a lot of uh, how a lot, lot to about how to learn the subject but uh, can you i mean uh, i mean uh, help for, help us further with uh, what what will be your, your approach if you were a student uh, of the ias exam how will you uh, approach the subject of indian culture and uh, 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 uh yeah uh, that is the question what will be your approach uh, i would uh, i like to answer two questions for myself to begin with a what is india and b what is culture so the first question first as we began with those images for most people india begins with indus valley and there is an elaborate debate whether the indus valley people went downward they were the original people they ultimately ended up in the southern most part carrying the dravidian culture there so i would like to define india more precisely for the purposes of the examination although the country was partitioned in 47 the culture could not be divided into two so there is commonality in culture between india and present day pakistan same between india and present day bangladesh sri lanka was never formally a part of india but very much a part of british indian empire so the similarities between sri lanka and the mainland india especially peninsular india is important and also when we talk of this you realize that the concept of india which was not only a country but a subcontinent started from the khyber pass borders of afghanistan to jungles of arakan himalayan snow covered peaks to the ocean so this is would be the geographical expense but within the geographical expense expense i would like to clarify for my own mind that basically uh, india was always a composite of many federating units so it may not be a federal constitution then but people recognize the separate identity regional identities of different people some were considered equal some were considered alien some were considered strange but the fact remained that all of them interacted and contributed to what we call indian culture now the second question which you asked is a little more difficult to answer but then again as you say we i would like would have like to clarify my own mind between culture and civilization so culture is one civilization across time might have experienced uh, several cultural uh, tendencies trends etc at the same point of time also there might coexist within a civilization several cultures at the same time or layers of culture uh, i i think the most interesting answer to this is given by amar sen when he talks in terms of multiple identities of an individual i would say that these are the cultural rares in a person uh, professor amar sen himself is a brahmo is a brilliant uh, economist studied abroad um, blossomed very young is a bengali bhadralok uh, a great um, scholar of sanskrit and western philosophy now all these things coexist in one individual but to go beyond that all of us have the same multiple identity problems so try to sort that out How, why do i dress like this what do i eat what is my favorite food that is what i said that if you are in kerala you say that look uh, my entertainment would be either kathakali now increasingly less so but if i see a movie i would like to see a movie which depicts my social reality but now travel is so easy or uh, communication through internet is so easy that everybody is familiar to some extent with a fellow indian's culture even if it is far off 
It may be in northeastern states, it may be in the heartland, it may be deep down south, it may be in the desert land. So I would say that culture would be, to my mind, not only high culture, dance, music, literature, uh, painting, but it would be folk singing, folk literature, what we eat in our house. Fine, we, we cook Pongal uh, for, to celebrate Pongal. But Pongal is not eaten everywhere in India. In Bihu, they have a different set of recipes which they enjoy at the same time as Pongal somewhere else. In the Hindi heartland and in Bihar, you would have Makar Sankranti and the Mashki Khichdi. So the moment you focus on what you eat and what others eat, what your festivals are, what other people's festivals are, the similarities and differences, not necessarily discordances, become very obvious. So culture becomes something which you are, which your identity is, the language you speak, the way you dress. Uh, people would comfortably dress up in Veshti and, and Uttariya and uh, go barefoot uh, inside their house. At other places, this would be considered uh, pretty primitive at the moment. So what we, how, without being judgmental, if we see, look at, look at the demographic profile of India. How many people are uh, tribal? How many people are forest dwellers? How many people live below the poverty line? How many areas are patriarchal or matriarchal? And then when you see how they live their everyday life, that to my mind is culture. What they use, what objects they use, not only for worship, but for everyday use. Do you eat off a plantain leaf? Do you eat off a metallic plate? What vessels do you use for cooking? How have they evolved over a period of time? What kind of... Uh, houses you live in. So if you are staying, why, where does the pagoda roof, roof come from? Either it's excessive rain or it is, where do the Malabar tiles come from? Where is the roofing of corrugated tin sheets come from in the hills? So you have interesting issues. You have the interesting pagoda-like structure in Hidimba temple in Himachal Pradesh. Obviously, it has not been a uh, transmission from Kerala to Himachal Pradesh. But it's the climate which has affected that. So I would like to approach my quest to realize what essence of Indian culture is, uh, interdisciplinary, with my personal experience, keeping my mind open and not trying to cram up. Thank you, Lord, sir, for the wonderful answer and uh, beautiful connections. And uh, one more thing, uh, uh, I mean, uh, students, and uh, as you might have already observed, uh, he's a master of interconnections. So, so uh, see how he interconnected different aspects of uh, history, polity, economy, society. And, uh, and, and uh, I, I hope that that's the real approach of learning. And he has rightly said the, the, the way to uh, learn Indian culture is not cramming, but, but by loving the subject. Uh, uh, and now I think, uh, uh, I mean, students can uh, start uh, asking questions to uh, professor, dear Professor Pan. Uh, and anybody who wants to ask questions, you can either use the voice chat option or the text chat option. You can raise your hands and, and please use the voice chat option so that the session will be much more interactive. Who wants to go next? You have to unmute yourself, Rajshekar. Hello, sir. Good morning. Yes, welcome. Uh, my name is Rashayam from uh, Tamil Nadu. I have a question regarding the mains examination preparation regarding the art and culture subject. Yes. one. Yes. Uh, how to go about the architecture uh, questions? Uh, because uh, it will be contemporary, but also the features, there's a lot of features, how to write precisely and uh, what they ask for that. Uh, very good question, Rajshikar. The problem is that whatever you read from whatever book you read, ultimately you have to write and reproduce. So what I would suggest is that you get into the habit of practicing writing your answers within the word limit without wasting words and putting it all the in essential information in one place. Now, suppose you are asked a question on temple architecture, you have to start from rock cut architecture in Mahabalipuram or the Shore Temple or the Rathas and come all the way through to the great Alora Kalashna Temple it was built in Rajput times and then you this should all be done in less than shall we say 
50, 60 words. And then you go to the other temples like we covered today, the Nagar style of temple, the Central India, Khajuraho style of temple. We did not do the Jain style. We did not do the Buddha shrines. But all that you have to practice two or three times. But it is not that you mug up your answer also. You get into the flow, like you describe somebody. So you, but, but your question is important because in you don't have infinite time or infinite space in the competitive examination. So that practice should simultaneously be conducted as you prepare. Uh, who wants to ask uh, the next question? Um, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Good morning, respected Alexa. This is Deepshika. Yes, Deepshika. Yes, sir. I want to ask the next question. Yes, please. Uh, she already asked that uh, culture is all about what we eat and what others eat, what we wear, what others wear, and what our festivals are and what others' festival are. So my question is that can we define uh, can we uh, distinctive uh, can we define components into distinct distinctive uh, can we define culture into distinctive components, namely material and non-material? Of course, material in the sense. No, uh, no, our no. attire, food, household, and non-material in the sense, our ideas, thoughts, beliefs are? Oh, obviously. Very good question, Deepshika. But there are two levels at which I would like to answer your question. Your question began by saying what we eat and what others eat. So the principal problem in studying culture is we and the others. The interesting part about Indian culture is that the other within the subcontinent is closer to us than other outside the subcontinent. So that's why I said there might be a festival of Bihu or a Pongal or a Makar Sankranti or a Onam or a Besaki or a Yugadi. People within the subcontinent would have more in common through shared history of peace and war than with they would have with others. So all Indians are we, the, including tribals, including different castes, including different communities. So it is like Shankar when he was asked to describe Brahman said neti, 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 not this, not this, not this. So you can also define Indian culture as not Chinese, not Central Asian, not um, Arab, not Southeast Asian, not European. And what remains would be India. It would have imbibed a lot from others. The second interesting question which you raised, point which you raised is, it is um, definitely very useful to divide while you are preparing between material culture and abstract aspects of culture. But the two are not divided by a watertight uh, compa by compartments or a sharp, unbridgeable line. Because when you say what you eat doesn't come out of the thin air. What you eat is grown. There is agriculture. There is processing of the food. There is cooking of the food. How you eat it on, you cook it or eat it on metallic vessels or some leaf, leaves, etc. is important. Ideas also developed from a material basis. So whether you like Marxism or don't like Marxism is another question or communism. But Marx did make a fundamental contribution to human knowledge that ideas are not in the realm only of abstract. They have a infrastructure over which they grow. So when you talk in terms, when you, when you have enough leisure, then you contemplate about the cosmos, the universe, the God, the God's interventions in human life, etc. Now, similarly, when material goods move along a trade route, like the spice route, like the silk road, ideas also move because things of value have to be protected by arms, by soldiers, uh, so that no trader should be looted by a brigand on the way. Once this happens, ideas and inventions also travel material with the, with the ideas. So the, the relationship between ideas, abstract and material aspects of culture is not so binary driven as, as we normally think. Because come to think of it when we say uh, intangible heritage of mankind is music and food. Now take music. Can you make music without an instrument? Can you forget about an instrument? A man is singing. Or a woman is singing. Can there be singing without a material uh, being uh, using the vocal cords and lungs to raise the voice and sing? No. So there is a relationship. And then this relationship, one step removed, is between ideas also. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. 
Yes, you can yes, go ahead. Sir, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Yes, you are audible. Uh, sir, uh, regarding this uh, culture and everything, sir, uh, mostly uh, we are biased towards this uh, Islamic uh, and Roman and other architecture. There is a South Indian architecture is there, where Chola architecture, Pallava architecture and Hoysal architecture, where the rocks are danced like uh, steel and other things. Much of information is not available on this, sir. Can you kindly elaborate on that? And second uh, point is my question, sir. My question. Yes. One, yes. one thing at a time. Uh, I would like to answer like your first question first. Question. I would not agree with you that the information is not available. I remember I used to read history about sixty years back, and the textbooks even then had a very prominent chapter on Chola. Um, period, Chola bronzes, Chola temple architecture, uh, and even the Pallavas and the Kanchi and the center of silk and Mahabalipuram and the port city dealing with Southeast Asia. There was a chapter called Greater India in our textbooks, even in high school in 10 plus 2 in NCRT it became much later, which talked in terms of Indian influence. And it talked of South Indian Tamilian interactions, the Raj Rajendra Cholas, Armadas, and the kingdoms of Shalendra, Majapahit, Sri Vijaya, Indonesia, Angkor Wat, and the Varmans. So I would not agree with that, that this information is only available about the Islamic architecture. I also, the slideshow which I shared with you this morning shows you clearly the Nagar architecture is not Islamic architecture. The Nagar architecture from Odisha reflecting in, into Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand is not Islamic architecture. The uh, Hajrao temples is not Islamic architecture. We also had the Gopurams and the Tanjore temple, certainly not there. So this is uh, some kind of a misunderstanding, a politically motivated spread that uh, we have only been emphasizing. Uh, we, we began our discussion with Indus Valley civilization. Where was Islam? <laughs> In this very civilization is almost 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. Yes, you wanted to ask something else, Raj Shekhar? Agreed, sir. Due to the bad connection, bad connection, bad connection, bad connection, I, got, connection I got lost. Uh, lost. Uh, lost. Uh, 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 I'm sorry about, I'm this, sorry about this, this, but I think, but the, I think the, the master the class master is on the YouTube. And you can uh, visit it again if your connection was not right. And I would uh, welcome any queries from you on my email at pushpeshpant at gmail.com. So I, whatever you think that has, because here we'll have a time constraint also, we might not be able to continue this uh, masterclass for a very great length of time. But you are, all of you are welcome to, uh, to get a copy of the book if you like. And then get in touch with me and ask specific questions, which you have not been able to, which I have not been able to answer to your satisfaction in this class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question, sir? Yes, of course, yes. Uh, sir, uh, so regarding the art and culture syllabus of uh, UPSC, right, and mains, uh, one topic which I find very technical uh, is uh, related to music. Uh, so the different styles of music and the technical terms in it uh, and, uh, and so on. So is there a method to uh, simplify it or understand it better? Uh, uh, that... You know, Yash, what I can tell you is that I, you must get a copy of this book. I feel very stupid recommending my own book again and again because the effort I have tried to make is to make the technical terms very, very easy for you to understand. <clears throat> now, why should you remember all the technical terms? What you need to remember is something very simple. There are seven notes in Indian music, which is called Sargam. Sare, Gama, Padhani, Sa. The same septatonic notes are there in Western music. They are referred to by different names. But let's stay with Indian culture. There, is, there are seven notes in music. And within the seven notes, the gaps between the seven notes are occupied by shrutis, which are micro notes. That's all you have to remember to begin with. You don't have to cram up too much even afterwards. There is ala, which is the elaboration of the mode of music. There is aro and avro, ascent and descent. Now, look, you don't even have to, we have so far covered only four or five technical words. Now you say there are styles of Indian music. It's very simple. You start with what you would like to listen to. Do you like to listen to A.R. Rahman? 
Have you ever tried to think that the tune in a film by A.R. Rahman is based on a classical tune or is borrowed from a symphony abroad? But let's see any other song. Do you remember a folk song? Do you, do you think a folk song has a relationship with a classical song? So I think when music is there, there are only three, four styles. There is a style of music called dhrupad, which is vocal. There is a style of music which is called khayal gaiki. Then there is light classical like thumri or ghazal. You go down south, you have the Karnatak music. And Karnatak music, you have very few words to remember. The rags more or less remain the same. It Thyagaraja's Kriti or the great Trinity's Kriti, the Shitar Bhagavatar and other people's Kriti. This is basically Telugu poets writing devotional songs, again, to Lord Krishna and to others, and you have the relationship. That is what I was trying to suggest to you, Yash, that if you try to connect things, even the technical terms become very, very uh, easy to understand. So you, what is the, then you say there is a Tal and there is a Lai. Now, tal is percussion, lai is a tempo the, of music or dance, but they are common to music and dance. You talk in terms of tal in dance and lai in dance. You look at a painting and you say a lyrical line. Now, a lyrical line has to have a certain movement, which is graceful. So, you know, basically, if you read this book, it will give you cues to they, it will almost become effortless for you to grasp the technical terms. The great um, work of aesthetics in Indian art, literature, culture is Bharat Muni's Natya Shastra, which says everything is basically focused on rasa. Rasa is the enjoyment of taste in food, taste in music, taste in literature, taste in painting. So the moment the sap, ras essentially translates as a sap. So don't worry too much about technical terms in the field of uh, in the field of culture. Isn't this the problem everywhere? If you are talking in terms, let's say what your subject is, you are talking in terms of international relations. You would be talking in terms of balance of power, uh, equations of power, deterrence, balance of uh, 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 you know balance of fear, balance of um, uh, you know you will go back to Cold War, you will go back to end of Cold War, you will go to rapprochement, the time. So there is no subject where there is no technical word. But what I am saying is that the cultural technical words are so much more enjoyable. Or you say, oh, mazag, I enjoyed myself. So you enjoyed yourself because you tasted the flavor of that music, that dance, that book, that literature. So I, I would not be very um, bothered about technical words because in all you will have to remember five to ten technical words. You go, you see cinema and it will say close up, a flashback, a flash forward, a western uh, mode. Or you would say this is a dark comedy. It is You would say it is realistic. It is neorealism. Now all that again would be specific words to a specific subject. So you can't possibly do without at a certain level, without certain specialized words. But I don't think that should be burdened with the idea that they are very difficult to learn. I presume that you are a science student. Oh uh, Yes, sir. Yes. So when you are in science, you learn functions, integral and variable calculus. You think in terms of Boolean algebra. You think in terms of dimensions. You think Correct, in, what can be more confusing than negative numbers and whole numbers <laughs> and fractions and series. So, you know, if you are not a science student, you would not appreciate this. Definitely correct. But, sir. but once you pass your engineering, pass your technical science subjects, you come to an area which you have not been exposed to. Uh, I think the problem is that if you permit me to say so, the multiple choice question format in our school level has ruined our general knowledge of students and their interests. Everybody says that only PCMB is important for your everything from engineering admission to quota to uh, IITs to so on and to MBAs. And you forget the larger dimension of education, which should have been part of your education to begin with. I face this problem at home. My grandchildren say, oh, we don't want to read Hindi. We don't want to read English. It doesn't count. Slowly, it comes to a period when you lose touch with your own cultural roots. Right. So that's, that's what the problem is. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Sir, should we take any more questions or shall we wind up for today? I, I think it would just mind up because let the students absorb and they are welcome. Give them, share with them my email and I will be very happy to give them uh, separate answers to each student when they send me my, they send an email to me.
Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and lots of their questions would be answered if they uh, if they picked up the book and had a look at it. Because I have tried to unburden it. There are no long answers. There are only short answers. The, there are short essays introducing different sections and the interconnections are brought up. Uh, correct, sir. sir. And I have an announcement for uh, Clear Eyes followers. Uh, the publisher top now, uh, actually an imprint of uh, uh, Wisdom Tree, has agreed to give uh, extra discount on the book for the Clear Eyes followers. Okay, all those who attended the session uh, who uh, needs a copy of the book, they can get a discount. All you have to do is either uh, email the publisher directly or you can uh, or email clear eyes we can forward the email to the publisher and you can get the extra discount so uh, as you all might have realized that the experience and expertise of the uh, uh, dear pushpesh pan uh, uh, i mean uh, we are very lucky to get a class of him uh, like what we had today but uh, unfortunately we have time constraints but luckily we have a book written by him so uh, that covers almost everything so there is no point asking him again like how to prepare architecture how to prepare music or how to uh, uh, prepare on, 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 on uh, music or whatever it is so uh, that everything is covered in that book and uh, you all can go to the and that book is also available in amazon so you can even directly get it or if you want an extra discount uh, uh, you can uh, email uh, to our support okay so th thanks a lot uh, Thank sir you. for having a wonderful session and thanks a lot for all the participants in the session uh, who Thank came you. and interacted with you. thanks a lot for the masterclass